Hi, my name is Pastor Austin. I'm so glad that you're joining us today for New Vintage Church Online. Before we hear from Pastor Matt today, I want to let you know about a few things that are really important that are happening right within New Vintage Church. New Vintage Church is sponsoring Safe Tree Street. It's the largest Halloween event that happens in Tri-Cities and uh, we cannot wait to be a part of it. If you would like more information on being involved in this amazing event, you can email Jeff at newvintagechurch.com. We're gonna take a moment to give today. I love that God talks so much about generosity. And I love it because really it's the heart of God. God is a generous God. In fact, in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus speaks to anxiety. I know that I've struggled with anxiety. I know a lot of people watching this have probably struggled with anxiety. But Jesus actually says this. He says, I don't want you to worry about where you're going to sleep at night, or what you're going to eat for food tomorrow, or where you're going, or what you're going to wear. He says, your father already knows everything you need. Instead, seek first the kingdom of God. We serve a generous God who knows what we need. He knows what we're going through. And the great news is this, God beckons us to trust in him. And one of the ways that we actually get to trust in God is by worshiping Him with every area of our life, including our finances. As we give today, it is not only an act of worship, it's an act of trusting God, that we are going to seek first His kingdom. If you would like to give today and partner with our church in our mission to see the gospel get out to every single person in the Tri-Cities, you can do so by going to newvintagechurch.com and select the giving tab, or you can text NVCTC to 77977. You'll get a link for push pay. You click that link and uh, it'll take you to the website and you can do automated giving there or you can do a one-time donation. It's safe, fast, and secure and you can give through push pay that way. Now we're going to hear a message from Pastor Matt. We're starting a brand new series today called Reunion and here is part one. Hey, good morning, New Vintage Church. I'm really glad that you joined us online to watch this message. Very excited to share what I'm going to share with you today. Thanks for jumping in. Bonus material at the end of this video. I'm going to tell you how I'm going to vote in the election. You don't want to miss it. Don't skip to the end. Watch the whole thing through. Today, we are jumping in as a church family, talking about almost an impossible topic in our world today. We're going to talk about unity in the body of Christ. And today's message one, our series is called Reunion because in some ways we're apart. We need to be brought back together. Very excited to start this. Uh, the idea of unity is such a big theme in the New Testament. It's talked about so much. It was Jesus's core prayer for his disciples that they would be one. In fact, in John, in Jesus's final uh, meeting with them, he says this, I pray that they will all be one just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you, and may they be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. Come on, unity leads to people coming to a place of belief in Jesus. S such a huge, important topic. And again, it may seem impossible, but I believe it's the church's hour to rise up and shine in unity and display peace like that for our world. Now, I'm going to, uh, as I'm introducing this message, it's been widely stated that there's two things you should never talk about at dinner, and that is politics and religion. And I'm going to hit both today uh, all at one time with one fell swoop. So I'm asking you a couple things. Please stay with me. I may speak on some things or read some scriptures, share some thoughts that may not be exactly how you would approach this. But as a pastor and somebody who's really prayed through this, I'm going to ask that you would stay with me through the whole entire message, hear my heart, see if God would actually want to do something in us that might be challenging, but could actually bring some great change. So I so appreciate that with you. Let's pray together. In fact, even as you're watching this on video, take a moment to pray with us. Jesus, we come to you as your church family, as your sons and daughters. God, my prayer, I just want to echo your prayer that you would be glorified in us and how we love one another and how we serve the world. In Jesus' name, amen. I am not a huge football fan. However, I do understand, uh, so, and by football, I mean European football. I'm a big American football 
Seahawks currently are 5-0, and and hopefully today as you're watching this, they go up again. But uh, when it comes to European football, not a huge fan. But I did find some interesting things online about that. There was, in 2016, in France, in Marseille, there was a big contest, bunch of teams there. Violence breaks out. And I want you to see this video clip from 2016 about the violence that happened there. Where the city of Marseille was shaken for a third day of riots by football fans. Police say several were injured in clashes among French, Russian, and English fans. CCTV's Dan Williams is joining us from Paris. Dan, talk us through the latest developments. What happened? How did it all start? Yes, as you said, a third day of uh, violence in Marseille. Seems very similar, it has to be said, to uh, events in 1998 in the World Cup here, also down in Marseille uh, as well, where England fans clashed with, uh, ahead of their match with Tunisia. Here, though, it's, uh, as you say, a third day of violence. Uh, it's unclear uh, and conflicting reports so far as to exactly who uh, is to blame for this. Uh, a large number of reports uh, blaming the large groups of English fans that had gathered in the Old Port area uh, ahead of the match had been drinking. Such a crazy story, and as I read about it and was enthralled with this as a news article, but there was over 30 people that were uh, hospitalized, one critically, so many people cut some bruises, and it was just this incredible thing. The thing that caught me was that this happened three days before the actual match of the majority of the fan violence. Again, these are fans in the streets, and the question in my head was, Number one, how, how is it that it seems like these uh, events seem to just be so similar in our world? But also, how is it that, that fans could turn from just in, enjoying a game and being a fan to turn to fighting for something that's really not theirs to fight about? The battle really should have been on the field and it should have been on what they call the pitch. But here instead, they're actually in the streets ahead of the game and there's violence, police are called and it broke my heart. It kind of echoes a little bit of our tension in the world today. And I'm gonna come back to the soccer story here in just a few moments. I do believe that in the United States today uh, that we're very divided and it's dangerous and it's causing despair in people's uh, minds and in their souls. I actually know friends of mine that I've talked to that as they have experienced all that's happening in the world, it has actually been overwhelming to them and knowing how to deal with that. A couple quotes I got from USA Today in a very recent article in the last uh, few days. A man named Alex Theodorisis, who's a professor of poli sci at the University of Massachusetts, he studied the country's growing partisan divide and he said this, a close contested election in our hyper polarized political climate could very well produce isolated incidents of partisan violence. And he also went on to say most partisans are willing to metaphorically dehumanize those of the other party. And this kind of dehumanization actually predicts greater tolerance for partisan violence. There was another uh, part of an article in the same paper that said that a new survey that just came out in the last few weeks said that a majority of U.S. adults believe that the United States is on the verge of a second civil war and that 40% of the people who voted uh, or, or were polled and said that they believe that also marked that they were on one extreme side or the other of the different political spectrum. You guys, I just, as a pastor, please hear me today. This is a very serious topic and I want to address it in a serious biblical manner, but I want us to be aware that our nation is in crisis. And I do believe this, that if we uh, all have a, an others in our life and we have an insiders and we have an others, but the church is called to be a loving influence as kingdom of God people in every sphere of society and in our political lives in who we work with and the people that are gonna come to our tables at Thanksgiving dinner, we are called to be peacemakers and bridge builders and to be prophetic voices for the kingdom of God. I think that because of what's happening in our world, the church at, at large has the opportunity to shine for a place of peace and being united. And for those of us who are Christ followers, come on, the darker the night means the brighter the light that we can shine 
And I think it could be a great hour for the church. Let me jump to the scriptures. I want to talk to you about the power of a little. The power of a little. And sometimes it just takes a little of something to change a lot. And Jesus actually begins uh, to unfold. We're going to look at three different places in scripture. Actually two places, but three different types of yeast or leaven, uh, as depends on how it's translated. And he's going to talk first about a positive image of yeast. And he says in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus also used this illustration. The kingdom of heaven is like the yeast that a woman used in making bread. Even though she put only a little yeast in three measures of flour, it permeated every, every part of the dough. And for those of you who have done any kind of baking before, if you add a little yeast, it does, it infects everything. And Jesus is saying that the kingdom of heaven is like that. It doesn't take a lot to influence everything. And this is why Jesus could actually start his ministry with 12 disciples and empower them to change the world. The kingdom of God is like yeast. Yeast is a substance that when added to flour and water and moisture, it expands the dough. It has an altering or a transforming element to it that brings influence and change. And Jesus is saying that you and I are like that because the kingdom of God is in us. And where we go, we should have a, an altering, a transforming element about us that changes everything around us. And it doesn't take a lot. Now, one of the things that Jesus needs as he's using us as his body is he needs to get our minds to line up in the way that he thinks. We've got to be kingdom minded. In other words, we cannot just continue to think like the world thinks, because when the kingdom of God enters into our life, we begin to follow God. We pledge our allegiance to Christ and say, we're going to live for you, believe in you. When that happens, we still know how to think like the world thinks, and we've got to change and renew our minds. And so the kingdom of God is actually an upside down or an opposite kingdom to this world. So phrases like, if you want to save your life, you've got to lose it. If you want to be the greatest of everyone, then you've got to be the servant of all. If you're going to be first, you've got to be last. And if, you want, if you're going to be last, you're going to be first. There's all these different ideas that are mindsets in the kingdom that are different than how we would think about everything else. With that in mind, I want you to, uh, I want to take you with me on a journey back to Oak Grove, Oregon, when I was growing up. And my dad wanted to teach me how to drive. And we had about three quarters of an acre. And in the very, very back, we had some trees. And my dad said, hey, I want to show you how to drive. And so he had a work van. It didn't have any windows on it except in the front, but, you know, just was for carpet. And he attached a trailer to it, takes me out in the middle of the trees and says, I want you to wind through these trees. And then he wants to teach me to back up. Now, we ended up jackknifing a little bit at one point, and I got very frustrated. He got very frustrated. We're okay now, but it was a painful moment that day. But the thing that I realized is that I'm turning and looking in the mirror. As you try to turn right, it would actually cause the wheels in the back to go left. As you went left, it would go right, and it was opposite of what you're used to. I think in Seinfeld, they came up with Pizarro World, and that's what it's like. And in the kingdom of God, Things are different and we think different. Our spirit, our heart, everything about us becomes different. And we have to be aware of that, that the kingdom of God is like yeast. It begins to change everything about us. Now, I want to introduce you, as Jesus does, to two other yeasts or alternating or transforming mindsets from one other scripture in the Gospels. In Mark chapter 8, this is a story where Jesus had just uh, taking a few loaves of bread and created a miracle to feed a lot of people. And then the disciples get done with that event. They get on the boat and they're traveling. They realize they don't have any bread, except one of them has a loaf. And Jesus uses that opportunity to say something that seems so out of the ordinary and out of place. As they were crossing the lake, Jesus warned them, watch out, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and of Herod. Beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and the yeast of Herod. Now you guys, today, literally, I was at the house and I was, maybe it was last night, I can't uh, remember completely, all the days are running together in my home, but I was cleaning out some groceries and putting in some new groceries and there was a loaf of bread that had been sitting out behind a bag of chips. And I looked at it, I pulled it up to see if it was still good. 
Blue and green and fuzzy. It would have made a great little stuffed animal, but it was not edible. And this is what would have been going through my mind when Jesus says, beware of the yeast of these people. I would have been looking at that loaf of bread and going, don't eat this. And Jesus is saying it has nothing to do with actual bread. But here he's given a very strong warning about two kinds of of influencing ideas, two mindsets, two spirits, if you will, that Jesus is warning about. The Pharisees were deeply opposed to the Roman government being in Jerusalem, and they were religious leaders. The Herodians were in alliance with the Roman government and wanted progressive uh, change and wanted to ride the coattails of Rome. And and here they are, and Jesus is saying, watch out, be aware of, have eyes to see that this mindset that they have can actually influence you and do not take even a little bit of it in to what you're used to. Let me talk about the yeast of the Pharisees for a minute. As Jesus is saying this, it's an odd phrase for us in our modern language, but he's saying the yeast of the Pharisees. He's meaning the religious spirit, the idea that there is an ideology that controls religion, and it's rooted in pride and arrogance and in control. And it lacks humility, and the, uh, a religious spirit is arrogant, and it doesn't have any ability to listen. It's not interested in your viewpoint, because we already know it all, and we're telling you. And that is the spirit of the Pharisees and this religious spirit. And as Christians, sometimes we can treat other people as if we know more than them and we're not interested in hearing what other Christians have to say. And because of that, it can come across that we're arrogant, have no humility, and we can even begin to treat other people as though they're not family and the family of God and they're not even friends. We actually can begin to push them out as outsiders. This is the religious spirit that's arrogant and causes us to believe that everything that we know has to be correct. Man, my concern with this, and I I would hope it's the same concern that Jesus had, my concern is that we've lost that family feel in America, in the church. And I'm concerned with some of the posts that I have seen Christians make to other Christians, knowing that they were both Christians. Statements like, I can't believe I would have sat in a same church service with you, or I don't know how you could believe that, or this person on this political party, or this issue, and how could you be that way? That is a religious spirit, and Jesus warns against it and says, do not have any of the yeast of the Pharisees. It's a religious spirit. Now here is the idea of the yeast of Herod. This is a political spirit. The Herodians, or the people who followed Herod, were actually very interested in politics. And politics, the, the um, spirit of politics, the political spirit, is always rooted in fear and in division. It wants to divide people. Somebody gets elected by making divisions and going, we're not like them, we're like this. We're not going to be like that, we're going to be like this. It can be the fear Uh, and and they motivate by fear. And so it could be like any number of fears. In our nation right now, if you were to watch the political debates again, which I don't recommend unless you take a lot of Advil and other things, but if you were to watch them, it's primarily fear-driven. It might be fear of economic failure. And this is what's driving people uh, to be so frustrated in their own personal psyche and in their own spirit today. Fear of economic failure, fear of a radically different future in our country, fear of a hate-filled society, or fear of massive COVID uh, deaths coming, or fear of civil unrest. And then what a political leader does to use that to their advantage is they say, but if you vote for me, I can fix that. It's the spirit of politics. And here's, that's how the fear drives it. Here's how the division drives it. I want you to imagine that there's two political parties, the Tea Party and the Coffee Party. Some of you who like history will really enjoy that. So the Tea Party and the the Coffee Party and the spirit of politics will say this. If you're Tea Party, then you believe everything on the Tea Party platform and you vote Tea Party and you put Tea Party signs in your yard and you make Tea Party posts on the internet. Anybody else that posts Coffee Party 
uh, propaganda, you debate that at whatever cost necessary. And if you're in the Tea Party and you agree with some of the things here, but then you say yes to some of the coffee party items, then you're no longer here. You're, you're, you're canceled, you're cut out because you're not Tea Party, you're something else and you're pushed off. That's the division and that's what it looks like. And Jesus warns about the, the religious spirit and he warns about the political spirit and says the yeast of the Pharisees and the yeast of Herod, those things can influence everything. And he's saying to us, and you guys as a church family, please hear me. Do not let a controlling, I want to be right over relationship or a political, hey, everything's going bad. It's fearful and division. Don't let either one of those things seep into our mindset. We are to have that third or actually the first of the three mindsets, which is the yeast of the kingdom of God. We are to be influenced by the kingdom of God. First and foremost, we are not Americans. First and foremost, we are Christians. And this is a key thing. We are kingdom people. We're kingdom people. Man, I, I uh, recognize that these are some big ideas we're talking about. And, and I appreciate your attention and walking through this with me. I wanted to share with you what I heard uh, Pastor Tim Keller talk about. Pastor Tim Keller uh, from New York, he's now, he's an author, but he's now currently um, just writing and doing speaking and his church has been handed over to somebody else, but wonderful man of God. He, he's very brilliant and he said that there's four key areas in our nation that the church should address. And do I have these on the screen? I wanna show them to you here. Number one is racial justice and equality. He says this is a kingdom thing that Jesus came to break down barriers between people groups. Here is two more, and that is helping the poor. All of us would agree that Jesus taught this so clearly. It's a kingdom issue that as Christ followers and people who care about others must do that. Pro-life is a, a biblical idea that God gives life and we must protect it and do all that we can to be for pro-life. And a fourth one is Biblical morality, speaking of sexual ethic, well, things like abstinence before marriage uh, and traditional marriage and protection for children in these issues. These are all four kingdom issues that need to be addressed by the church because the Bible, the kingdom mindset, actually has answers and guidelines for these things. And here's one of the interesting things. If you think about it, Republicans typically focus in on two of these to the, to the general uh, ignor, uh, ignoring of the other two. Democrats tend to focus in on two of these kingdom issues and, and not so much on the other two. And there's conservative and there's liberal. And then what happens is churches in America tend to, to fall in line and preach and speak about maybe some of those issues, but not so much on the others. And that's a divisive thing, and we're called to be above that. We're kingdom people. All of those issues, all of those issues are Bible issues. They are kingdom issues that God calls us to address. Man, I, I, uh, I want you to know that kingdom people are independent, and our allegiance is to heaven and the purpose of God over anything that happens in the political scene in America. And kingdom people can uh, be both and. We can be a part of this and a part of that. We can agree with this. If there's something good in this platform, we can agree with that and also agree with something good on this platform. And the fear and the divisiveness would tell you, you can't be for that. You've got to be all in with one or the other. And that's that political spirit. So if somebody were to say, oh, black lives matter, our assumption is that that person then must also agree with everything that's on the Black Lives Matter website and they're Marxists, they're for abortion and the disillusion of the American core family, the nuclear family. And it's like, man, could we, could we be above that? And could it be that maybe we actually care, somebody could care about racial equality and still at the exact same time be for uh, the dynamic nuclear family as described in biblical values? The answer is yes, because we're kingdom people. The idea could look like this. I can be pro-woman 
and for women and their advancement and their rights, at the same time as a kingdom person, I could be for the protection of the unborn. And somebody in, in this world will go, I don't understand that thinking. If, if you're, either, you're either for women's rights or you're for pro-life rights. And it's like, no, I can actually, as a kingdom-minded person, see value in some of those things. And I don't have to buy in completely to, to the, you know, the parts that I don't agree with. It could look like this. We can stand for the biblical definition of marriage being between one man and one woman and call that our home base as, a, as an understanding of what marriage looks like in Scripture, while at the same time ministering to, being friends with, praying for people who are struggling with same-sex uh, same attraction, and even having them sitting with us in church and, and minister, you know, ministering to them and being with them. And people go, no, you have to be one way or the other. You cannot say that you're compassionate and filled with love on one hand, and yet disagree with their lifestyle on the other. And it's like, no, I'm not going to buy in to your pharisaical or your Herodian viewpoint. I'm going to be kingdom-minded, and we can do both. Politics say that we can't do both, and that you got to choose a side. Come on, but we're kingdom people. We're kingdom people. Let me go back to the issue in France in 2016, when they were having that match, and all these people got hurt, and there's fights in the street, and the game hadn't even happened yet. Is it possible that that's a picture of maybe some of us in our Christianity who've gotten too excited about an upcoming event, an election, and it's gotten to the point where it's not just a jersey we wear, it's become an identity of who we are. And whatever political stance we want to take, it's possible that as Christians, we have made and bought into the yeast of division and fear and control and gone, it's got to be this way or it's got to be that way. And if it's not, then, then, then you're on the opposite team and I'm actually going to fight against you. And if it has to come to violence, I'm at a spot where I'm willing to do that. Can I say that the, the futility of what we saw in the streets of Marseille, France, is the same futility for Christians to own as their identity and the thing they're willing to fight for, their political views. You guys, come on. As your pastor, I want you to think about this biblically-minded, kingdom-minded. We are here to build the kingdom. Let's spend our energy on that. I wanted to give you a short list I'm just going to read through of 10 things that might be signs that you're having po politics as a priority over the kingdom in your own life. And I want you to have some humility and some prayerful, spirit-led interaction with me for just a moment as we go through this, because maybe God would want to challenge us on an individual thing or two, and maybe we've actually taken what used to be just a jersey we would wear and celebrate once in a while, and now it's fighting words, and you're the enemy, and I'm right. Let's take a look at these. Number one, we see others and the other side as enemies. No longer peaceful debates, no, no longer ideologically different, but actually you are now the enemy and you are morally wrong and I'm morally right. The second one is this, you're deeply angry and you can't always place where that anger comes from. That could be a sign that politics have gotten a hold of you because division leads to anger and battle. Third one is this, Maybe you've been more bold for politics than for your faith. And you just have to look at that and go, do I speak out more about my political views than I ever have for people in need or people that are marginalized or for the cause of Christ? Have I invited people to a gathering of pol political you know, involvement more times than I've invited somebody to church to hear the gospel? Fourth one, it could be a sign of our politics having priority in our life is that we're looking for individual scriptures or proof texts to prove the side that we're on instead of looking at the whole of scripture and studying it out to get a whole worldview. That's a sign that we bought into the yeast of the Pharisees or the yeast of the Herodians. The fifth one is personal views and the ones that I hold so dearly have become more important to me than the biblical commandment for unity. You guys... If another Christian brother 
has a different viewpoint than me. I am commanded to love them, have an ideological conversation with them. I'm to engage in the political process. But unity at the end of the day within the church is actually more important than our political views. Number six, another sign of our politics having priority is this. We can perceive a particular candidate as God's man. Like this is going to save us. That's the one he was prophesied about. He's the chosen one. Come on, this, this is a sign that maybe we're too attached to something that God is not that attached to. Number seven, mocking or incendiary uh, posts on our social media. And, and this is maybe a, a primary concern for me as a pastor because this is such a public thing. And it's grown so much in the last four years, in the last eight years, and 12. It's continued to grow, and it will continue to grow. And we as a church need to be aware that a, a good dialogue, talking about ideas, moving a conversation that gets heated into a DM or a PM instead of on a public profile page is a good idea. And that, hey, I'm willing to talk. I want to hear what you have to say. I want you to consider those things. That's great. But when people begin to post uh, pictures with memes and words that are completely mocking the other side, that is not helpful for the dialogue. It's not the way of the kingdom. It's not peace driven. Number eight, maybe you stop praying for both sides. Listen, we're called by scripture to pray for kings and those in authority so that we can lead, lead peaceful lives. The Bible actually commands us to have an involvement with uh, the political uh, things that are happening around us, no matter what century we live in and no, no matter what country we live in. However, we're called to pray for both sides. And listen, prayer will soften your heart. Prayer will give you God's heart for things. One other, uh, two other signs would be this, making political decisions based on fear. If you go, man, I got to vote this way because I'm scared about the future for this or this, that might be a sign that your trust is in politics more than your trust is in God. And the last one would be this. You have a belief that speaking up politically is speaking for God. If you've gotten to a spot where you go, hey, I actually believe that what I'm doing is helping the kingdom of God because I'm speaking politically, then you've got some wires crossed would be my challenge to you. And that you've got to unthread your biblical beliefs with your political beliefs and see that they're different, and that we're kingdom people first. Let me make a couple statements here to you. If Trump is reelected, the church is going to grow. If Joe Biden is elected, the church is going to grow. If we are taken over by China, the church is going to grow. If we go bankrupt as a nation, the church is going to grow. If the internet goes out, or we go to war, or we hit an unprecedented, uh, unprecedented level of COVID or some other disease that is uncontrollable, the church is going to grow. And because of that, we have got to be kingdom-minded. Come on, this, this wonderful nation is, it, I love it. I'm, I'm an American citizen. I, uh, I think I have a 4th of July t-shirt with an American flag on it in my drawer. I vote. I'm registered to vote. I care about the policies because those policies affect people. But when I approach that, I want you to know that as a, as a person, not just as your pastor, but as a Christ-centered, kingdom-minded person, I approach the voting as, hey, I'm giving it my best shot. I'm going to lend my weight and, and what I can do towards different political things, different uh, you know, viewpoints or different issues like Tim Keller listed out for us that are important and matter to people as best as I can. But I'm recognizing that even though that may help a little bit in the short term, my trust is in the kingdom of God. And what we need is God. We need revival in our nation. We need God to show up and change things more than we need to have a right vote or uh, the right uh, political party or the right person in office. You guys, the Bible has this um, idea that we don't live here. Our primary home is in heaven. And the term that people have used for a long time is that we're, we're sojourners. In other words, we're journeying through this land, 
but we're only temporarily here. Our, our citizenship is in heaven. And I want to quote three things from Jesus to show how he saw this in his own life and in our lives and in the kingdom. In, in his life, Jesus continued speaking. He said, you are from below. I am from above. You belong to this world. I do not. And here we, we see that Jesus is identifying himself as not being from here, but being from heaven. He kept it in order. Next, if the world hates you, Jesus is talking to his disciples. If the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. The world would love you as its own if you belong to it, but if you are no longer part of, or, but you are no longer part of the world, I chose you to come out of the world so it hates you. There's an element that not only Jesus isn't from here, but now because we're followers of Jesus, we're no longer from here primarily. We're, we're part of the kingdom of heaven. And third, Jesus answered and said, my kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. If it were, my followers would fight. So I wouldn't be handed over to the Jewish leaders, but my kingdom is not of this world. Listen, the kingdom of God exists in the world as yeast, as leaven, as an influencing agent to make a difference here in this planet. But we are sojourners. This is not our home. Our allegiance isn't here. Our allegiance is to the King, Jesus, and to heaven. So who am I voting for? I'm going to vote the same exact way as Christian comedian Michael Jr. is going to vote. And I wanted to show you what he had to say about this because what he has to say echoes some of the thoughts I had in my message. And I think you'll enjoy this. Yo, so it's like election time, right? And uh, I don't know if you have a friend that's thinking about voting a way that you're not thinking about voting. Uh, and now y'all had like a heated discussion. It seems to be a lot of that going on. Like y'all mad at each other because he like that dude and you like the other dude. By the way, at the end of this video, I'm going to tell you who I'm voting for. Yeah, so you need to be ready for that. Um, so a lot of relationships are getting kind of messed up right now because people are in all the election and Black Lives Matter and the, the, the pandemic. People are just mad at each other. So here's a cool question that you could ask. Uh, you could ask yourself, what is it that you like about somebody you don't like? Ooh, ooh. You could do this with a candidate, as a matter of fact. You, whichever candidate you just can't stand or whatever, answer the question. What is it that you like about the person you don't like? Whichever candidate it is, whatever the case is. And I'm not saying say something like, I like the fact that he not going to be president or or I like the fact that this person live in a different city and I do. No, no, no. I want you to actually think about a character trait that you actually like about someone you don't like. And if you can't come up with anything at all, the issue is probably you. Because you should be able to come up with some trait about another person that is likable. If not, your heart is really, really hard and you have to look to soften it up. So instead of me saying, what is it that you do like about someone you don't like, I'll give you a little bit of cushion and say, what could you like about someone that you don't like? And if you can't even come up with a could, you in a bad place. And you really got to kind of check your heart because no, because you don't want to live there because that's not hurting anybody but you. There's, a, there's some people that I may not like, but I can absolutely tell you some things that I like about them. So you should do this. It's kind of fun. It's kind of liberating. It's kind of, uh, it's kind of cool. So let me tell you who I'm going to vote for. Okay. I didn't want to get, I didn't want to do this and I didn't want to put this all out there, but I feel like I need to just let you guys know. Um, I'm going to vote for the, for the dude, for the, the white dude who's in his seventies. It's just a choice that I've made. And um, is I know some people are not going to agree with it or like it or whatever, but um, I didn't see I didn't see any other option. So that's that's the way I'm going. And uh, I hope you do the same. I'm Michael Jr. And um, I hope you approve this message. Thanks, Michael Jr. I, I really appreciate that. That's how I'm voting. Thanks for sticking around to the end for that. Hey, on a serious note. Here's how we're ending today. I know it's a little longer message than we've done online, but it felt like this was such important material to cover. I wanted to cover what is it that we can do to change right now. As you're at the end of this message, here's a couple things. Number one is you can refocus your passion on fighting for the kingdom. 
Come on, we're called to be battle uh, warriors in prayer. We can pray for the nation. We can pray for leaders. We can pray for the people in the tri-cities that have never been to church, have no hope in God, don't know the story of Jesus, that God would draw them into church, that God would bring salvation and transform lives. That's where our passion needs to be. The second thing we can do in a practical manner is to self-audit your social media and your conversations and take an honest look. Have I been combative or have I been just ideological? And there is a difference there. And I want us to be the kind of people that in our conversations that we have with other people, that when they leave, they go, hey, they disagreed with me, but they were gracious. And I might go to their church with them someday. And the third thing is exactly that. We want to have an invitational heart to make church a place for peace. I want you to imagine that every person that you're going to interact with in a political manner, online, or in a conversation, that that person is going to show up at church the following Sunday, and they're going to sit next to you or right in front of you, and they're going to see you there. And how did we represent the king? We want to have an invitational kind of heart. These are things we can do right now. Let me pray with you as we close this out. Jesus, I so thank you for your spirit and the work that you've done on the planet and what you're still doing in your children for the kingdom of God. And I pray you would set our hearts to prioritize you, the king and the kingdom over every other thing. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless your family. Can't wait to dive into the idea of unity in the next coming weeks.
Though the night make it darker, though the waiting seems long, you have always been faithful to remind me of your love. You System through the ages, oh, what a friend of mine. So I'll remind my soul to bless you, standing firm upon the truth, knowing you cannot be shaken.
What an amazing message from Pastor Matt this morning. Listen, if you made a decision today to follow Jesus, you might be sitting on your couch, watching this on your phone, or you might be sitting at your laptop, and you made a decision today to actually start a relationship with God, we're so excited for you. Here's what you can do. You can text 97,000, you text the word NVC Life. We'll send you a few different videos about prayer, Bible reading, baptism, helping you in your walk with Jesus. If you want to stay connected with New Venice Church, you can do so a few easy ways. Obviously, you can go to our social media accounts and search on Instagram and Facebook, NVCTC. You can also subscribe to our weekly newsletter on our website. You'll get a weekly email that'll go right to your inbox, letting you know all the new stuff that's happening at our church every single week. That's it for our New Venice Church online service today. We're so glad that you joined us. And we will see you next week.